If you'll turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. The book of Acts chapter 6. And we're going to look this morning at verses 1 through 7. Uh, We have been working our way through this book. There's 28 chapters in this book, and we're on uh, chapter 6 now. And I think this is sermon uh, 21. And so we're going to be in this book a long time. But praise God for it. I think there's so much material, so much meat here that we can uh, gain and uh, grasp. So uh, let's continue our study here of this book. Uh, Before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask right now that you direct our minds to your word, Lord. I pray for a few moments that we can focus, that we don't lose our attention. We're not thinking about what we're going to do later or, or tomorrow or that sort of thing, but we are just focused in on your word that you help us to understand it. Give me clarity of speech, clarity of thought, clarity of mind, of action, so that I can speak your word, uh, Lord, without causing it to be difficult to understand. Uh, God, I pray that you'd speak through me and to me. Anoint me for this task that I'm not capable of. Speak to us, God. That is your work, not ours. And I pray for each person in their own language that they will understand, that they will respond appropriately this morning to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week, we saw the apostles once again before the Sanhedrin. Now, here they are receiving the full fury of the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin is the religious leaders made up predominantly of the Sadducees, and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection of the dead. They did not believe in the miraculous and so when they, you have the apostles out preaching that Jesus Christ has been resurrected from the dead and they are performing signs and wonders and miracles, you can only imagine that this is not going well with the religious leaders of Jerusalem. And so they won't here at this point, as they have brought the apostles before them again, uh, the apostles are clear that we're going to continue to preach this gospel message. We've been commanded to do it. And you murdered the Messiah that you've been waiting on, and God raised him up, and he's seated at God's right hand. And they're saying all of this before these religious leaders, and of course they don't like this, the religious leaders, they want to kill the apostles. But last week we saw that a calmer voice, a calmer head stood up, that in Gamaliel, who was a Pharisee, but he had considerable influence, and actually he's the one who trained Paul the Apostle. So this Sanhedrin decides that they're going to listen to Gamaliel and they're going to do what he has uh, asked them to do to kind of restrain from it. I guess the thought process was that we murdered this, or we killed this man. I know they didn't see it as murder. They felt like that they uh, had put to death Jesus. uh, And of course, they didn't see him as the Messiah, these religious leaders. We put him to death. And now his name is continuing on in the apostles. Maybe if we put them to death, it'll continue even further. So let's just stop. Let's hold back. Let's just see if this will go away. He cites two examples. Remember, he cites uh, Thutis. Uh, We don't know much about this Thutis, but he led a revolt after the death of King Herod the Great. And he led this revolt probably around 6 A.D., And uh, in that revolt, it didn't last long. It disappeared pretty quickly. He was put to death, and all of his people were scattered. Then he also gives this other example, an example of Judas the Galilean, who led a revolt, also a tax revolt. And he says that Judas was killed, and nothing really ever came of it. And so what his point was, if God's not behind the apostles and what they're preaching, it'll just go away Uh, eventually, at some point. But if God's behind it, then we're fighting God and we should just uh, back off and and realize that. But the problem with his example of Judas the Galilean is he didn't tell all the truth because out of Judas the Galilean came the zealots. And actually this lasted a pretty good while. The zealots were a very nationalistic group. They wanted to see... 
the Jews restored basically and that they could be independent, that sort of thing. So they wanted to see this. And so that lasted a while. So really his example that what Judas had done just went away because God wasn't behind it wasn't necessarily true. And it, we also talked about this theory, uh, this bad theology that he had, that if God's behind something, then it flourishes. If he's not, it goes away. I, I, I think it's evident from Scripture that God was not behind the Sanhedrin, and they continued on. Uh, we could think about today in our society, uh, there are uh, tons of false religions out there that are doing really well. We talked about the Buddhist and the Hindu and, and all of these different religions that God is not in support of, but they're still flourishing. So that doesn't work to think, well, over time it'll just go away. And I know we didn't get into this, but I want to mention this this morning. If Satan is the God of this world, and what we mean by that, not all powerful by any means, but what we mean is he's the influence of this world, then the things that are of evil, uh, such as we mentioned last week, Playboy and evil things like that, they are going to flourish on this earth, and they're going to last, uh, regardless of whether God's behind them or not, because Satan is influencing the evil in this world. So it's bad theology from Gamaliel, but it still saved the apostles, and they're able to leave. They're beaten and flogged, and they're able to go out and continue preaching as they had already told the Sanhedrin that they would do, uh, they began to continue, or they continued proclaiming the good news that the Messiah was Jesus. Now, in our text today, we'll see that ministers will be added to the church, that there will be more ministers added to the church. Now, in the first part of verse 1, we notice that there is growth in the church. In those days, as the number of the disciples was multiplied. Now, the new movement of Christianity or the way, the life that was called there early was growing, and it was growing quite rapidly. Now, people were flocking to the meetings of the church, and great numbers were becoming disciples of Christ because the chief meeting place was still the temple complex. The evidence of this growth must have been a daily source of frustration to the high priest and all of his friends. You can only imagine they've beaten these apostles thinking that, well, maybe just a little stronger than we were the first time. We warned them the first time to not speak in Jesus' name, so we beat them this time. Maybe they'll do what we tell them, and it doesn't take long to realize the apostles are going to obey God rather than men. And uh, again, back to uh, the children's sermon earlier, we are to obey authorities placed above us as long as their authority does not go or contradict with Scripture. When it contradicts with Scripture, the apostles were clearly told by Jesus and by the angel that took them out uh, there, we, we looked at last week, that brought them out of prison. They were commanded to preach the gospel message. So we obey God first and foremost. The church is growing here, but growth in size do not solve all the problems. Very often, the larger the church, the larger the problems, something that will now prove itself to be the case here in the early church. Satan again attacked the church from within. Again, it was over the question of money. This time, however, it involved not just a couple of individuals, but a whole segment of the church. And if you remember back, the first uh, attack that Satan had upon the church was in the form of Ananias and Sapphira. And they had sold a piece of property, and they said that they sold it for this price. They come in and give the church this price, but they say, hey, we sold it for this price, we're giving you this, but they really weren't. They were giving this of what they had made off of the sale of their property. So they lied. That was the problem. It wasn't that they had to sell their property or that they had to give a certain amount but it was that they lied about what they gave. They wanted to be impressive. They were seeing all that was happening in the church, and so they wanted to impress the church and say, oh, we gave this big number to the church, and so their lie brought instant death to both of them. But this time, we don't see just two individuals as an issue here. We see a whole segment of the church. And the second part of verse 1, a complaint arises. And it says there, uh, verse 1, the second part of verse 1, 
there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews and their widows uh, that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. Now, there are two kinds of Jews within the fold of this church, as there were two kinds of Jew, uh, kinds in Jewish society in general in those days. There were the Hellenist Jews, and then there were the Hebrew Jews. Now, the Hebrews were Aramaic-speaking and mostly native-born Palestinians, while the Hellenist Jews uh, were uh, Greek-speaking Jews of the dispersion. They had been dispersed when uh, the, the nation of Israel and the land of Judah had been overtaken by foreign uh, powers. They were dispersed, and now they were coming back. They were Greek-speaking Jews, especially of the Greco-Roman world. The Hebrews tended to be a narrow and rigid with few interests outside their own small world. The Hellenists were generally much more ready to recognize the better features of the great Gentile world beyond the confines of just the promised land. So tensions now between the Hebrews and the Hellenists uh, are coming about. They had been about for a long time to the very uh, beginning of the Hellenist period when the brilliant world of Greek thought and culture burst uh, upon the Jews and threatened to destroy Judaism, both with its philosophy and its persecution. Now this tension had entered the church. We have the Hellenists with the Hebrews, and so we got a tension here in the church. Now in this early church, there was great concern for the poor. That's a great thing. In an early church, there was a great concern for the poor. Remember that wealthy men like Barnabas donated their estates to a common fund to help care for the poor. Widows made up a fairly large portion of the poor. The daily distribution of charity was in the hands of the Hebrew believers, not the Hellenists. And the Hellenist believers, rightly or wrongly, they felt that there was this discrimination going on against their widows. So tension develops and it comes to a head. Now, of course, we know the real culprit behind this. Satan's goal is always to divide and conquer. If he can divide the membership and discourage the leadership, he can break apart the church. And that's what's going on here. You have an attempt by Satan to break the church apart, to make half the church or a portion of the church at least to feel like they're being discriminated against, that they're being looked down on, that they're not being treated fairly. Is that not what he does today? He comes in, he finds maybe even one person. He finds that person. He, he tells that person that they are being looked down on, that they're not being treated fairly. And before long, that person kind of draws in a crowd, and, and all of a sudden you have a click in the church of one group that feels like, things aren't the way they should be, and then you've got a, another group uh, that's kind of formed against that group. I've heard many preachers make this statement, You uh, and we'll just use the Baptist since we are Baptists as our example. Uh, you've got a Baptist church, and it's called Unified Baptist Church or something like that, and they break apart because of some issue in the church, and one group goes and forms Friendship Baptist Church, and the other one goes uh, forms another Unity Baptist Church or something along that line. And isn't it amazing that you can be so divisive and then go form a church and call yourself friendship and that sort of thing. We must be careful about allowing petty things to get into the church. Now, I'm not calling distribution to the poor petty by any means, but often today what happens in the churches is petty differences break us apart, tear us apart, and that is simply Satan. I like the song that we sang this morning about that we're coming back to the heart of worship where it's all about God. When we come to church for that reason, all those other things don't really matter, do they? All the other little things. I'm not here uh, worrying about what someone thought about me or said about me or laughed at me or this kind of thing. I'm here to glorify God. When you come for that reason, that should be the only reason that you're here. And when you come for that reason, you, you won't leave for little, little petty things. In verses 2 through 6, we see the addition of ministers. So we need ministers here added to the church. The first part of verse 2 speaks of a meeting that took place. 
It says, then the twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples. The apostles are dead and determined here to immediately deal with this situation. Even though they had the authority to make a decision themselves, uh, they wisely chose to include the entire church. And they were going to include them because this was going to be a momentous change here in the way that the church is run. The affairs of the local church are run. We have here a blending of apostolic authority mixed with congregational activity working towards a united decision that should characterize all local churches. That's what I love about the congregational uh, government in a church, and that's how we're run here in the Southern Baptist Church. Each church is individual, and so the members of that church run that church, and you can see where we get it. It's right here that the apostles, instead of just going ahead and making a decision on what should be done, they include all of the church in that decision. That's why I so often invite everyone who's a member of the church to come and be a part of our quarterly business meetings, our annual business meetings, because you have a say in what happens in that church. But, of course, to have a say, you have to be there to have that say. But, uh, again, that's what's great about a congregational uh, government, a church being run that way. We are, we take this serious in our denomination that we are a priesthood of believers. If you are a believer, you've got to say because you are a priest in that sense, and that praise God for that. We are a priesthood of believers, as it says in the book of Hebrews. Now, the second part of verse 2 through the first part of verse 5 speaks of the motion that was made here, the motion that was presented in this meeting. The second part of verse 2 gives the priorities of the apostles. It says, it would not be right for us to give up preaching about God to serve tables. Now, this is plain common sense by the apostles. There's no point in the apostles doing something that anyone can do when they're doing something that no one else can do. And this was not a question of uh, position, but of priority. The situation here was not that the apostles thought themselves better than the serving of tables for the church. It was simply a matter of putting first things first. Nobody would expect the CEO of a large corporation to be working down in a mail room. I think most of us would have a problem with that because you're supposed to be running the company. What are you doing down in the mail room? You're uh, disregarding uh, your purpose here uh, as a CEO. So here, handling the errands of the church was important, but the apostles sensibly decided that since they could not do everything, that they would concentrate on what they were called to do. They were called to minister the word of God. Now, verse 3 gives the practical point of the motion that has been proposed here. It says, therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, who we can appoint to this duty. The criterion for public office in the church was not business savvy. It was not financial success. It was not an organizing ability. It's sad that today that many churches, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for business uh, savvy, uh, financial success, those sort of things. But that's not what the early church was looking for. The apostles had other and more significant criteria to lead. A successful man might not be a spiritual man. On the other hand, a spiritual man might not be a sensible man or a wise man. So let us take note of the criteria here. A man successful in business might qualify, but just because a man is wealthy does not mean that he's spiritual. So the criteria must include other things as well. First, he must be a good man to serve. That was of utmost importance. Paul the Apostle said in the book of Romans, verse 5, verse 7, that for a good man, some would even dare to die. He had to be a man who commanded the love and the respect of others because of his personal integrity and unblemished character, a man who avoided evil and devoted himself to the well-being of others, a good man. Then, too, he must be a godly man. 
a man who loved God, honored God, full of the Spirit of God. And he also had to be a gifted man, full of wisdom. Not all good men, not all godly men are wise men. He had to be a man who made wise decisions, sensible decisions. These are the practical aspects, and believe it or not, they still are. This is what should be sought in any leader in a church. God wants his church to be served by such men. No man has any right to any office, however humble that man may be, if he's not qualified for that office by these three criteria, that he is a good man, that he is a godly man, that he is a gifted man in wisdom. No wonder the money squabbles in the Jerusalem church came uh, to such a swift end when waiting on tables was handed over to seven uh, such men. It was a sensible precaution also to, to have seven men instead of just one because that divided the workload and it kept money matters above suspicion. Let's look at verse 4. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching ministry. So the apostles say, we're going to devote ourselves to prayer and the preaching ministry. Now all men and women must pray and all can have a share in the ministry of the word, but not all are called to give themselves wholly to such spiritual ministry. The apostles, of course, were down the ages since Pentecost. God has seen to it that his church has been served by such men, called and equipped by his Holy Spirit and dedicated to a purely spiritual ministry. It's not a profession into which one enters uh, as a matter of personal preference, such as a medical or legal profession. One does not graduate from high school and decide that they want to be in the ministry. One is called to this work by the Holy Spirit. Now, in the first part of verse 5, we see the motion passed. It says, the proposal pleased the whole company. The observation, the suggestion of the apostles was so sensible, it was so wise, so fair, that it was picked up unanimously by the church as a whole. Again, showing that the church as a whole was there when this decision was made. Everyone received this decision. In the second part of verse 5 through verse 6, we get a glimpse of the men chosen. The second part of verse 5 gives us a list of these men. Let's look at that verse. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte from Antioch. The dispute was between the Hellenists and the Hebrews. The Hellenists had complained of real or maybe even imagined discrimination. It's very significant that all of these deacons, these seven deacons chosen by the people, had Hellenist names. The inference being that they were all Greek-speaking Jews. What a tremendous act of grace. This is just as if maybe we were here and we have uh, half of the church or part of the church is African-American, the other part is Caucasian, and uh, maybe the African-American part of the church feels like that they're not being treated fairly, and we go and choose some leaders, and those leaders are all African-American. That's kind of the same situation that happened here. What a tremendous act of grace it was. These Greek-speaking Jews, the he these Hellenists, were chosen uh, to help here. The first mentioned deacon was Stephen, of whom it said he was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He would demonstrate that very shortly, and we'll get to that next week. Next, we have Philip, always to be distinguished from the Apostle Philip. This is not the Apostle Philip. We often call Philip the deacon here, Philip the evangelist, his evangelistic gift would soon be evident to the church. Stephen became the first martyr of the church. Philip became its first missionary. Prochorus, uh, Prochorus is not, uh, not so well known. According to tradition, he became secretary of the Apostle John, then bishop of Nicomedia, and ultimately he was a martyr. We know nothing of the next four, which illustrates the general principle that much of the work of God is 
carried out by unknown, unsung individuals who faithfully carry out the tasks that are entrusted to them, quite content to leave the limelight to others. Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, adds a note about the last on this list. He tells that uh, Nicolaus was not even Jewish, but he was a proselyte, that he came from Antioch, a city soon that would leap into prominence in the history of the church. Some think that Luke himself was from Antioch also. Next, we see that these seven men are charged. Look at verse 6. They had them stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Now, the laying on of hands was a common Jewish practice, as we see from the Old Testament in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 4, when an Israelite brought a, a, a sacrifice to the altar, he was required to identify himself with that sacrifice by laying his hands on it. Uh, the apostles thus formally identified themselves with these delegates in this familiar way. This laying on of hands simply gave the, these seven men public accreditation to function on the behalf of these apostles and on the behalf of the church as a whole. It didn't put any special power in them. It just gave them the ability. It, it showed all of the congregation that these men are set apart and they're to do what they've been called to do. Now the church has survived another attempt by Satan, the deceiver, to divide it. And here the church is stronger than ever, and the leadership is encouraged to continue the preaching of the word of God. And we see this gospel message is proclaimed. And in verse 7, Luke writes that the church multiplies. In the first part of verse 7, the scope of this multiplication is seen. It says, so the preaching about God flourished. The number of disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly. So we see a great increase. In the church, the disciples in Jerusalem did not just multiply, they greatly multiplied, so it really expands the church here because of the preaching, because of wise decisions, choosing wise and sensible, godly, good men make a difference. The church is multiplying here. And in the second part of verse 7, we see the significance of this multiplication. It says, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. And no wonder, these priests, they more than anyone else knew that the old-fashioned Judaism of which they were most visible representatives was finished. It was over. There had been a day not long before when some of them had gone into the temple as usual to trim the lamps in the holy place, and they had been stopped cold in their tracks the temple veil had been rent, rent, it had been ripped from top to bottom. No human hand could have done this. The veil was as thick as a man's hand. And besides, no Jew would ever do such a sacrilege thing. The veil was rent. For the first time, the priest could look beyond the golden altar into the holiest of all and see the sacred ark with the outspread wings of the cherubim they could see where generation after generation the high priest had stood on the Day of Atonement and sprinkled the blood. These priests would have compared notes. The rending of the veil had happened just when Jesus of Nazareth had died upon that cross. And for a while they had resisted this, but now many of the priests have come to faith in Christ. However, there would come a problem with this. The influence of these priests would tend to tie this new movement, Christianity, closer to traditional Judaism. For even though these good men could clearly see that Jesus was indeed the Messiah and that the rending of the veil signaled the end of an era, old traditions still die hard. Any future confrontations between Hebrews and Hellenists, the influence of these men would all be on the side of the conservative, Judaistic type Christianity dedicated to preserving as much of the old order as could be conserved. And they would want the new wine to be kept in the old bottles. We often see this even today, uh, holding on to traditions that can stunt the growth of the church, preferences rather than principles sometimes 
rule the day. We got to be careful for that in the church. We talked earlier about uh, division in the church. When someone comes in and feels like that they're not being treated fairly or something's wrong, someone's being mean or nasty to them or, or something like that. But sometimes also our preferences, the way that we come to church, I'm not talking about principles. There are principles in Scripture that we hold to, and it doesn't matter what anybody's preference is. Those principles are true. Jesus is the Son of God. If someone comes in and says Jesus is not the Son of God, either they're going to change that opinion or they're going to be out. Uh, we can't play with that. Those are principles that you hold to and you have to stand behind and, and you don't play with those principles. But preferences, and I'm going to use an example and don't let this stir up any, any issues among you, uh, but I'm going to use an example of music. It's just an easy one for me. Uh, I've kind of fought this battle all my life. Sometimes in music, we have preference. We have preference. Some people like contemporary music. They just love it. It's, it's what they, they, they would want that, nothing else. You know, that's going to one extreme. Then you also have the other side, that traditional music. Yeah, it's the only thing that we can, can play, and that's the only right thing. Uh, but two or 300 years ago is not biblical times, and so we've got to remember that. The Bible talks about singing a new song. There's all kinds of instruments in the Bible, but I'm not here to debate which one is better. I like both, and I praise God for a church where we do both, that we have both, that we are blended in our worship, that we sing hymns, that we haven't thrown them out, that we also sing contemporary music. Now, my contemporary music is Michael Card in the 80s, and I wish we could go back and just do that, but that's my preference, and I would not push my preference on anyone uh, and I've got some stuff that's a lot more contemporary than that. But anyway, you see my point. Uh, we, when we go in and push our preferences on people, we can divide the church, and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we're willing to, to be open, as long as it's not compromising principle, that we're open to what others think. And I'm having to learn to do that. And, and you may not think that sometimes, but uh, I have a way of being really nice and getting my way through nice, uh, niceality, I guess we could call it, and, uh, but I want my way, and I'm having to learn to, to say, no, there, there may be another way. Someone else may have a better way than I do. Let me listen uh, to their opinion and not just uh, try to, to manipulate the situation, and so we have to be careful about that because that's what causes a lot of the division in the church is where some people or one person or some people want their way and they'll only have their way, and when they don't get it, uh, they start a, a fight and trouble, and, and it breaks the church apart. So I want to encourage us this morning to learn a lesson here, to be good, to be wise in, in our thought processes, to be willing to listen uh, to others and to love others. The Bible teaches that we are to bear with one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, talks about bearing with one another. And sometimes it's hard to understand what that means, but I think this is a good example of what it means. Bearing with one another is saying, okay, I can put my pride aside, it not have to be about me, and we'll just do something else. We'll do something different. As long as it don't compromise principle, we'll do something else. That's bearing with one another, at least a part of that. Let's be a unified church. And I think when we are, and if we are, that uh, we will be different from most churches. Most churches are not unified completely together. And I want that to be for us. And I think it will be if we remember that everything is about Jesus Christ, that it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about Christ Jesus. Let that be our heart today. And that's my prayer. Uh, we're going to sing a final song, a final hymn. Uh, Karen's going to come and lead us in